Welcome to Money Matters. I'm Emily Johnson, Certified Financial Planner and Managing Director of Polaris Capital Advisors. This is our inaugural January edition of Money Matters, and we're really excited to have you back with us this year. Of course, we did not go over the fiscal cliff as everybody was expecting, or if I guess you could you know, assume that maybe we went over just slightly, um, so we don't have uh, the gloom and doom scenarios to discuss that uh, you know, we had been thinking about in December. In fact, the market is in somewhat of a holding pattern here as we head into the first quarter of 2013. We're not hearing as much about the perils of going over the fiscal cliff. The media has stopped using the phrase, kick the can down the road, fortunately, although I'm sure we'll come up with something brand new that we'll hear over and over again over the next two months as these negotiations continue. But we're definitely still staring down the barrel of a whole lot of uncertainty. And of course, as everybody's prognosticating about what 2013 is going to look like, um, you know, we're hearing a huge range of, well, we're going to have massively outsized growth. We're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Everything to, no, we're going to see no growth, you know, if we continue down the same path uh, you know, with the debt ceiling discussions, et cetera. So some common themes that we're seeing as we kick off 2013, really nothing tremendously different from what we were looking at in 2012, um, except for one, one thing that will be sort of interesting to watch as it, as it grows, and that's the changing of the guard in Asia. It has the potential to drive a lot of growth in that region of the world, which also, of course, is going to drive growth, growth elsewhere, hopefully. Uh, so that's something that we're watching as a, as a positive um, driver in the markets these days. But we also have these continuing concerns over the U.S. debt ceiling, the negotiations that are going to go on there. That has the potential to be even more uh, difficult and more challenging to the markets than probably even the discussions over the fiscal cliff. So it'll be interesting to see how that continues to pan out over the next two months or so. I guess we have even less time than that right now. And then, of course, you have the continuing theme of Europe. We haven't had to talk about it too much here recently, but that's quietly continuing uh, in many of the, uh, of the European countries. So we're watching how that is going to impact the market as well going forward. Uh, we're just not seeing a whole lot of resolution. It's just continuing to, um, to roll on. So we'll see how those factors, those themes play out in the U.S. stock market over the next couple weeks, especially now as companies are, gonna re com sorry, companies are reporting their fourth quarter earnings and providing guidance on their expectations for growth in the, for, in the first quarter, in the first half of 2013. That commentary is going to be really interesting to listen to, not just so much on the earnings reports, but more so what kind of guidance management is actually giving for the first quarter and the first half of 2013. Because I think a lot of what we're going to hear is that management is still somewhat guarded. They're really not sure what their tax structure is going to look like. They're not sure what the economic outlook is, what consumer sentiment will be, et cetera. Um, so it's really going to be interesting to hear that commentary over the next couple weeks. Hopefully shed some light on management's expectations, how they're going to manage in this continuously uncertain environment. Are they going to be looking to hire? Are they going to be investing? Um, what factors are they going to use in making those decisions? Um, it, it'll definitely be interesting to watch. Um, it probably is also going to be interesting and painful to watch as this debt ceiling debate continues to take shape. You know, this is a, it's a tremendous opportunity uh, you know, as a lot of people are saying, it's a tremendous opportunity for the politicians to actually come in, make a difference, really create some clarity, uh, you know, for the business community going forward, which is really what our economy needs. I think a lot of economists agree. What our economy needs, we need that kind of clarity for management to be able to, to take some action, to invest, to hire, et cetera. So this is, you know, it's a tremendous opportunity, but it's also uh, a tremendous challenge. So we'll, we'll see which one wins out. But one thing is definitely certain that you know, we as a country cannot afford for our debt to continue to grow or for the interest on that debt to become more expensive. And that's a, that's a certainty if our debt to GDP ratios continue to be so out of line. So that's something that hopefully in Washington that they're looking at and um, will take seriously. Certainly when you're watching and listening to the business community, uh, you know, the, the writing's on the wall. There's something has to be done there in order to, to rein in that spending and rein in the debt or, or we're in a world of hurt. Um, so what are you going to do? I mean, as you're sitting here looking at your portfolio now coming into 2013, of course, this is the time when everybody's sort of gathering their thoughts, getting their financial house in order. They have their New Year's resolutions, maybe less spending, maybe pay more attention to uh, my investments, whatever it might be. Um, so what is it you're going to do right now um, to prepare for this uncertainty and the possibility of raising interest rates, what that might do to the market, et cetera? So we have a couple of ideas, and we'll be right back uh, to discuss those ideas and how you can manage in this uncertain environment going forward. So please stick with us. We'll be right back with more Money Matters.
Welcome back to Money Matters. As we were saying earlier in the show, one certainty that we're looking at in this uncertain market is that interest rates are going to go up. Whether you're listening to economists from the left side or the right side, most economists, most analysts agree that interest rates pretty much have bottomed. And I know we talk about this a lot and not uh, trying to beat a dead horse, but interest rates really are a huge driver in the markets because, of course, when interest rates are kept artificially low, the goal of that, the goal of the Fed in doing that, is trying to drive people into riskier investments, trying to drive uh, them to take money out of bonds and put them in the economy, in, sorry, into uh, equities and trying to drive growth there. So that's one motivator. But they can't keep those rates artificially low forever because, of course, market factors are eventually going to cause those rates to go up, whether it's through inflationary concerns, uh, you know, positive market, or through the situation that we're looking at right now, more of a negative driver in the sense that, you know, if our debt, uh, if our debt to GDP ratio continues to grow the way that it is, that's a negative motivator, and that will cause interest rates to go up because we will have a riskier, uh, a riskier environment than we have previously had. So those kinds of drivers are definitely saying there's something that's going to happen that will cause rates to go up eventually, regardless of what the Fed says about trying to keep rates extremely low. In fact, recently, though, you know, as we've seen some positive um, market movement, some positive economic movement, even the Fed came out and said, well, you know, yes, we're trying to keep them low through 2014, but if we do start to see a positive job market and they actually started to quantify what it is that would cause uh, them to not keep those rates as artificially low. So we've definitely seen in the market, which is always forward looking, that interest rates appear to have bottomed, whether you're looking at ETFs, whether you're looking at individual bonds, whether you're looking at new issues. Uh, there are a lot of ways that you, know, that you can identify that in the market. And we're definitely seeing the market uh, make the assumption that rates have bottomed whether they're going to spike up you know, is certainly uh, not known, but they definitely have bottom. So how can you, as a retail investor in this relatively uncertain environment, ensure that you're not going to be the last one to the party and avoid damaging your portfolio by not doing anything where we see the writing on the wall that, that, uh, that these interest rates are going to go up? So one thing that we've said over and over again, and I apologize for repeating it, but it's true, one would be to pare back your treasury bonds and treasury bond mutual funds. So treasury bonds tend to perform worst in a rising rate environment. Uh, rising rates sig signal an improving economy, and you know, there's really no need to flock to safety at that point. There's going to be more opportunity. You're going to be able to keep up with inflation uh, much, much healthier uh, in areas outside of treasury. So number one is definitely going to be paring back um, treasury bond mutual funds in order to keep pace with inflation. Um, so that's number one. Number two, if you desire to keep your bond allocation on par, if you want to have, say, 60, 70, 80 percent of your investments in bonds, because one, that's what you know, perhaps, or two, it's what you're most comfortable with, um, or you have different feelings about the um, equity market, go with, with what you know, of course. But if you're deciding that you want to keep your bond allocation on par, then make sure that you're swapping out some of those safety trades, the treasuries, for things like floating rate bond funds or high yield corporate bonds. Floating rate bond funds, and we've discussed this before, um, are you going to be looking at bonds that are actively, uh, that are going to be actively traded or that are very short term, depending on where they fall in the corporate structure? Um, and you can actually look them up, Google them as floating rate bond funds um, and, you know, see what opportunities are there. They're going to be a little bit more flexible. So as interest rates go up, the bond prices won't necessarily fall quite as quickly. Um, you'll have a little bit more flexibility there. Uh, than you'll have in other areas. Another place to look, of course, is in high yield bonds. High yield bonds, sometimes called junk bonds, you know, not, not all high yields necessarily need to be junk, uh, but they tend to be of a lower credit quality. They're lower on the um, corporate structure. So in the event of bankruptcy, if a, if a company goes under, your investment grade bondholders are usually going to be paid back first because there's usually something else backing it. High yield bonds are probably going to be paid back well after that, but before stock. So you're taking a little bit more risk when you're looking at high yield but really, right now, the risk is, you know, is a lot healthier. A lot of companies have healthier balance sheets. They have healthier cash flows. So those high-yield bonds, even though they might be rated at a lower level than, say, you know, an investment-grade bond, obviously, uh, you, know, you, you are being rewarded for the risk that you're taking. And it's a relatively low risk compared to what we were looking at, say, in 2008, 2009. Um, so again, if you're looking to keep your bond allocation on par, then I would look at swapping it out for different types of bonds. Diversify your bonds, diversify um, you know, your issuers, but also diversify 
where in the corporate structure you're looking into high yields, maybe even you know look over in uh, in Europe into the emerging markets. So uh, you know that's that's the second thing that I would definitely look at here in this environment. Um, what else? Reduce um, reduce your allocation if you if you are reducing. What kind of a guide? One would be to reduce your allocation by about 10% or so. And again, this is based on your age. It's on your risk profile. Um, you know how your bonds are held. Are they in funds? Are you holding ETFs? Um, do you hold individual bonds? Um, so again, consider all of those factors when you're looking at reducing your, uh, reducing your allocation. You also want to look at what kind of capital gains do I have? How's that going to impact my portfolio? Do I have any capital gains? Um, you know, do I have municipal bonds? How, what is the tax structure going to be on municipal bonds? So when you're looking at reducing that allocation, really take a good hard look at your whole bond portfolio, not just uh, you know, just a basic percentage of I have 50% and I need to pair it back. Really look at that in detail. Um, and educate yourself. If you have any questions about your bond portfolio at this time, this is a great time to go out into the market and to get answers to your questions. Go to your financial advisor and ask questions. Have them do a review. Uh, you know, we wind up doing credit reviews of bond holdings all the time uh, for individuals to see what credit might have changed, what issuers might have changed, and where we can uh, reduce people's risk in, you know, in that way. So now's a great time to educate yourself on your overall bond portfolio if you found it to be you know, a point of confusion. Um, and then lastly, so number four is going to be move into equities on dips. I mean, we are going to have opportunities for dips. We've had a nice little run here over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I think that the market, of course, as it's forward looking, was anticipating that the fiscal cliff would be solved in some way and, you know, further, you know, just further avoided. Um, but we're, you know, we're, we're definitely in, in uncertain and, uh, and uncharted territory at this point as we're looking at this next negotiation on this uh, debt ceiling. I think that the politicians have shown themselves to be willing to, to hold out to, you know, try to have, you know, a very strong political discussion even uh, you know, if it's to the extent of, of harming the economy and harming the markets. So we could definitely see opportunities um, to buy on dips, especially with individual names, with individual, say, financial institutions, um, is one where we've seen a lot of volatility. Um, so it's, it's worth looking at right now. And again, this is earnings season, so you don't necessarily want to make moves in advance of earnings announcements, but it's, it's a great indicator of where we're going to see the market going forward. It's a great indicator. Um, you know, of additional value that could be there. So be looking for opportunities to move into equities on dips, especially here in this first quarter, as we're going to see, I think, a lot more movement than, uh, than most people would like. We're definitely going to see a spark in volatility. Um, we're at extreme low levels of volatility right now. The VIX, which is the fear index that we've talked about before, is at an extremely low level. So it's, it's likely that we will start to see that spike. It's tough to keep that low for, for a very long time. So we will experience some short-term uncertainty, um, but we should be really well positioned. And if you're buying on dips, you should be very well positioned for the point when, this, when the Fed does step away and we do start to see the markets uh, you know, move without these artificial forces. Um, so something to think about here. And actually, we should probably take a quick break because we're going to be right back and we're going to talk about current yields, ways that you can find uh, some more money in the markets. So we'll be right back with more Money Matters in just a minute. Welcome back to Money Matters. So we're talking about yield, opportunities, uncertainty, all of these things that we're seeing in the market right now. And what I'd like to focus on right this second is yields. And everybody's always giving me a call saying, hey, where can I find a great yield with no risk? And unfortunately, these things just don't exist. And if anybody tells you it's there, they're not telling you the truth. Um, but a few things to consider here when you're looking at um, really low interest rates and wanting to take on low risk relative to other opportunities that are in the markets. Just a few things to think about. Number one, based on current yields in money market funds, which we all know to be 0. .000 nothing, it will take approximately 1,400 years for an investment in these funds to double in value. So 1,400 years, you know, we're, we're probably not going to be, you know, looking at a whole lot of value there. So you know, when you're looking at your opportunity in money market funds, yes, you have very, very, very low risk, but you're not going to see a whole lot of growth there. And of course, we're not going to be, you know, doubling anytime soon. 
Next one that we're going to look at, long-term treasuries. Long-term treasuries. Slightly better, but you really, you're only going to have to wait until the middle of the 21st century. So a couple hundred years for investments to double if you just have long-term treasuries. So, you know, if you are right now in your 40s, 50s, 60s, and you're looking at trying to boost your, uh, boost your investments, you're going to be looking at the next few hundred years for those investments to actually double. So either of these type of risk-free investments are going to see their purchasing power wiped out by even a minimal increase in inflation. And whether we're talking about inflation like, you know, what a gallon of milk is going to cost or the kind of inflation that you see in healthcare and in education and the things that we really do spend money on, that inflation is happening rapidly and it's happening now, uh, whether people like to talk about it or not. So these risk-free investments are not going to enable you to keep up with your quality of life, with your standard of living that you have and that you want to have in the future. So be thinking about that when you're looking at these safety trades, um, that investing in a 10-year treasury, as, as one article that I saw, said it's a surefire way to lose your money safely. Not really something that we want to do. So you have to open your mind up to a little bit more risk these days. Um, and of course, doing it in an educated, uh, in a grounded way makes a lot of sense. But you have to be able to open your mind up to a little bit more risk when we're looking for not just yield, but also growth. Um, so a few areas that you might consider there. One we've just talked about, and that was high yield bonds. High yield bonds, anything that are triple B and below, um, you're going to be looking at bonds typically with maturities of about five to seven years. And you're going to get probably at anywhere from a two to four um, percent higher yield than you're going to be getting on treasury rates. So you know, you're taking a little bit more risk. I mean, everything is, is relative. I don't know if that's considered a little bit more risk to you, but you're taking slightly more risk in where you're sitting on the corporate structure uh, for companies, but you're going to be getting right now almost double and in some cases triple the yield that you'd actually be seeing in the 10-year treasury. So some, that's one area to be looking. Another area, as we said, is those floating rate, um, and a great place to look for that is floating rate funds, floating rate bond funds. I don't usually advocate much in the way of, of um, bond funds, but floating rate funds tend to be a little bit, uh, a little bit more flexible in how they handle and, and uh, the type of uh, bonds that they're holding. And so you're going to see them ebb and flow a little bit more when we have steady increases um, in interest rates, when we have an uncertain environment. They tend to perform relatively well. Um, and then the last place is going to be investment grade corporate bonds. So companies have been hoarding cash, improving their ability to pay down debts. And so that's, that's going to be another good place to look. You're not going to have the same kind of yield there um, that you're going to have in high yield slash junk type bonds. Um, but, you know, you're probably going to have at least a slightly higher spread than you're going to see over treasuries. Um, but, you know, consider that, you know, consider maybe having a variety of, of um, investment grade corporates, of bank loans or, or floating rates, and also of high yield. Having that diversity increases your odds of of growth, but also of weathering a storm if we wind up with a storm. So, you know, you can't avoid that risk return trade off. You can't ignore it. There's definitely going to be a trade off when you have that extremely low risk that you're going to have in your CDs and in your mutual funds. You also have really at this point next to no reward. As we were just saying, a few hundred years for doubling, that's, that's not really what we're, you know, what, uh, what we're needing in order to keep up with, uh, with inflation. Um, and you also can't ignore the risk of rising interest rates. That's what we've talked about it over and over again. I know it's like I'm, you know, uh, just beating a dead horse, but it's really it's something that is going to happen. It is going to impact um, the markets. We've been talking about it for a long time, and you're really starting to see it trickle in. So something to really consider. Um, and these are, you know, just sort of some basics that I think that will help you weather this short-term uncertainty that we're seeing in the market. Now is not a great time to be making any large-scale changes to your portfolio. As we've said before, now is a great time, just as it was about six months ago. Make yourself a list of maybe opportunities or some different names that you're interested in. If, if, you know, if you follow the market this way, make yourself a list of some different investments that you might like to make and at what level those investments actually become economical and make a lot of sense. Make that list because those opportunities probably will come down the pike again uh, in this uncertain environment that we have where there will be some more volatility, it's inevitable, uh, you know, given the Washington situation that we have. So we definitely will see that. And now, of course, getting back to basics right now as we're coming into January, now's a great time to look over your portfolio again. Again, don't make it, it's not a time for big wholesale changes, um, but consider, okay, we're entering a new year. How much closer am I to retirement? If I'm already in retirement, what does my portfolio look like here as I come into this new year? 
Is there any rebalancing that needs to go on? Now's a great time to do that, just kind of cleaning that up. Take a look at what your, what your spending expectations are for the year, looking at your budget for the year. If you haven't done that, this is a great time, of course, to, you know, these New Year's resolutions. It's a great time to kind of get your financial house in order. At the same time that you want to join the gym, go ahead and call your financial advisor and ask him or her to go over the basics of your portfolio. What kind of an allocation are you looking at right now? Uh, you know, what sort of risk does that imply? Ask those questions. It's a great time to have these conversations. So anyway, those are, those are just a few ideas for what you might be looking at now as, uh, as we're going into the first quarter of 2013. We'll have a lot more commentary over the next coming weeks from management um, and should provide some great food for fodder and uh, some other discussions that we can have. So I hope you'll join us back with uh, Money Matters in the coming weeks. I am Emily Johnson. I appreciate all of your commentary, your questions. Um, we've been getting a whole lot of them here recently, so I, I really appreciate it. Please keep them coming. I love your ideas for future shows. Um, love to incorporate those, so please check us out on Facebook. Shoot me an email. Uh, give me a call. I look forward, to, uh, look forward to hearing from you. So again, this is Money Matters. We'll see you back here next week.